Let's take a look at some of the important equations we're going to use in our study of uniform circular motion. The first one is the velocity of the object as it travels in a circle. We know that velocity is distance divided by time. So if we're moving in a circle, the distance around the circle is the circumference. And the time it takes to go around the circle one time, by definition, is called the period. So if we take the circumference and divide it by the period, we get the tangential velocity in meters per second of the speed of the object as it moves in a circle. Here's our equation that we've already talked about for centripetal acceleration. The magnitude of the centripetal acceleration is equal to the tangential velocity squared divided by the radius of the circle. Newton's second law, we know it as F equals ma, but it is also applicable to circular motion, where the centripetal force, which is the force that causes the centripetal acceleration, it is equal to the object's mass times centripetal acceleration. So it's you see that it's just F equals ma, but now it's centripetal force and centripetal acceleration. Recall that the direction of the acceleration vector points to the center of the circle. So that means the force that causes the acceleration also points to the center of the circle. And in fact, that's what the word centripetal means. It means towards the center of the circle. So when we say centripetal force, and I ask you which direction the centripetal force acts, that's kind of like asking you, what color was George Washington's white horse? The answer is in the question. To say it as centripetal means towards the center. Another important equation we'll be using uh, is one we're already familiar with, and that's our equation for friction. Friction is equal to mu times the normal force. And lastly, another equation we'll be using is Newton's universal law of gravitation, and that says that the force of gravity between two objects is proportional to their mass and inversely proportional to the distance between them squared. So we're going to apply this equation to satellite problems that are orbiting the Earth. So in that case, the force that holds the satellite in orbit, its centripetal force, which is the gravitational force, will be equal to the gravitational constant times the mass of the satellite times the mass of Earth divided by the radius of the orbital circle squared. It's important to understand also that in these problems, we can apply concepts of uniform circular motion to parts of a circle. It doesn't have to keep moving in a circle continuously. For example, if I'm driving down the road and I make a turn only a quarter of a circle, I can still apply uniform circular motion to that one quarter of a circle. During the time that I'm moving in that uh, quarter of a circle, I can assume I'm moving in circular motion. And we call this here the radius of the turn, as if this was one complete big circle and this was one fourth of it. The first example we'll look at is, I call it airplane on a string. It doesn't have to be a toy airplane. It could be anything. It could be a rock. It could be a weight. Anything that's hanging from a string and then we set the string and the object into circular motion. So looking at it from above, this would be the object as it travels in a circle of radius r and with tangential velocity v. Looking at it from the side, I see it, uh, the radius would be here, and this little notation indicates that it is traveling into the page on the left side. That means it would be traveling out of the page over on the right side. And here's a force diagram using this picture right here. Here's my object, my airplane or rock, whatever it is. It has in the vertical direction weight pulling it downward and the tension in the string acting along the direction of the string. So that's the force diagram. Now something about these circular motion problems, we're going to set up our coordinate system so that the x, the positive x-axis, is always towards the center of the circle. So you can imagine as 
the coordinate system being inside the toy airplane or inside the rock that's spinning in a circle. It moves with the object and the positive x direction is towards the center of the circle, the centripetal direction, and the y direction will be up straight up into the air. So if we choose our coordinate to system to be that way, here is my tension force broken down into its X and Y components. Uh, there's a component of the tension that is toward the center of the circle, and there's a component of the tension that is upward. Then we're going to apply Newton's second law to both the X and the Y direction. In the X direction, there is acceleration. There is a net force. It is towards the center of the circle. That is the centripetal force, and that produces a centripetal acceleration. I see from my diagram that the X component of force is FT sine theta. That is my only force in the X direction. And I'm going to replace AC, centripetal acceleration, with its equivalent of tangential velocity squared over R. And then I will solve that equation for F sub T. In the Y direction, there is no acceleration. The, the object is not accelerating up or down. So the sum of the forces is zero for zero acceleration. And in the upward direction, I have the Y component of the tension, which I've labeled FY. And in the downward direction, I have the weight of the object. So FY positive upwards, mg negative downwards, their sum equal to zero. So the y component of the tension is equal to the weight. In other words, it is the y component of the tension that is holding the rock or the plane, whatever it is swinging around on the string. That is the force that is holding it up in the air and supporting its weight. So Fy in this diagram we see is Ft cosine theta. That equals mg, and I'm going to solve that for tension force on, uh, in the y direction, and I'm going to substitute it over here for the tension force in the x direction. And I see that on either side of the equal sign, I have m, so it cancels out. In other words, the mass doesn't really uh, change anything, whatever the mass is, as far as velocity and radius relationship. And then I'm going to solve this for V. Rearranging algebraically and solving for V, I see that I get the square root of the radius times G times the tangent of the angle that is created with the vertical and the string. So what is this saying? It is saying that for an object swinging on a string at radius R and angle theta, it will be moving at this velocity regardless of its mass. That's what we saw here, that the mass canceled out. Then what is the period of the circle? In other words, how much time does it take to go around that circle at that speed? Well, we know that the velocity is equal to the circumference divided by the period. So I solve that equation for T, capital T, the period. And I make the substitution of what I got for velocity into the denominator over here. And uh, that simplifies then to 2 pi times the square root of r over g tan theta. So in other words, an object swinging around on a string at radius r and angle theta will have a period calculated by this equation here. Here's our second example for uniform circular motion. Uh, a circular turn on a horizontal surface. So you're driving your car around the parking lot in a circle would be an example. Or your bicycle on a flat surface, you're driving it around in a circle. We know that if we were on a very slippery surface, it would be hard, if not impossible, to turn. So that tells us that it is the frictional force that is providing the centripetal force. If you were going around a turn and hit a patch of ice, you would continue sliding in a straight line and you would lose the friction between your tires and the road and you would no longer be able to turn. An object in motion stays in motion in a straight line and that's what would happen if you lost your frictional force. So here's our force diagram. The frictional force is the centripetal force that points to the center of the turn. 
uh, my circle is like this. My coordinate system, the X axis points to the center of the circle. And in the Y direction, I have my normal force and my weight. And in the X direction, I have my centripetal force of static friction. So again, let's, let's apply Newton's second law. In the X direction, the frictional force is my centripetal force. So Fx is replaced with Fc to indicate centripetal force, and Fc is replaced with Fs to indicate static frictional force. And that is equal to mass times acceleration in the X, which is centripetal acceleration, which is V squared over R. Static frictional force is equal to mu times the normal force. So I'll pause there for a minute and go over and take a look at my Y direction. In the Y direction, I have the normal force and the weight. I know there's no acceleration in the Y direction. So that the sum of those forces equals to zero. In other words, the normal force is equal to the weight. I will then substitute in mg for fn in my x direction to get this equation. And again, I see that the mass cancels out on either side, which tells me that it doesn't matter what the mass is. My maximum velocity in that circle will be the square root of r times mu times g, regardless of the object's mass. OK, so. What is the minimum time, what is the period, to go around the circle at that maximum speed? Again, we'll use our equation for velocity that is the circumference divided by the period. The velocity we just found was mu times r times g all to the one-half power. And I will do some algebra and solve this equation for t. And I see that the time it takes to go around the circle at that velocity v is equal to 2 pi times the square root of r divided by mu times g. So that is the period or the time it will take, the minimum time, because I'm going at the maximum velocity. The rotor is a ride at an amusement park. All it is is a big round room. They let people in, and people line up against the wall. And once everyone is in place, they begin to rotate the ride. The wall provides a normal force, which acts as the centripetal force, which holds the people in the circle. And it also provides a frictional force in the vertical direction between the wall and the person. And when that becomes sufficiently large, they drop the floor out from under your feet, and the frictional force supports your weight. If you've ever been on one of these rides, you'll see that the wall is made out of a very uh, sticky rubber, very similar to that what you would see on a ping pong paddle, so that there is a high amount of friction for a low normal force. So here's our force diagram for the rotor ride. This dot here represents a person standing against the wall. The wall provides a normal force, which pushes the person towards the center of the circle. The weight of the person is down, and the frictional force is what is going to hold the person up. So we're going to try to predict what is the minimum tangential velocity needed uh, to keep the person from slipping down the wall once the floor drops out from under their feet. Again, we're going to let the positive x direction be toward the center of the circle and the y direction be straight up. We're going to apply Newton's second law to the x and the y directions. So in the x direction, I have the normal force. That acts as my centripetal force, which provides my centripetal acceleration. So I come up with normal force equals mv squared over r in the x direction. In the y direction, I have the frictional force upward and the weight downward. So uh, And they add to zero because there is no acceleration in the y direction. And I see that the frictional force is equal to the weight, and the frictional force is also mu times the normal force. So if I solve this equation in the y direction for the normal force, I get mg divided by mu. 
I can plug that in over here in the X direction, and you see that the M's cross off from either side. What does that mean? It means that the mass is not important. The same minimum speed will uh, cause a light child to uh, stick to the wall, and the same speed will also allow a big heavy person, such as a 250-pound adult, to stick to the wall at the same speed. So uh, the M's drop out, and I solve for V, the square root of G times R over mu is the minimum tangential velocity so that a person will not slip down the wall. Our next example is a banked turn. You can see here a banked turn is a turn in which the surface on whatever is turning is not horizontal, but it is tilted at some angle. We call that a banked turn. And it's worth noting that even though we've been talking about objects moving in a circle, uh, you can just have a part of a circle. Bicycle, for example, could go through a turn that is only part of a circle, but during that turn, we can consider it to be circular motion. All right, so here is our angle of the bank. How much is the surface of the roadway tilted? And again, we're going to let the center of the circle be the positive, positive x direction. So here is the center of my circle. Towards the center is the positive x direction, and upwards is the positive y direction. Here is our force diagram of the forces acting on the bike or the car, whatever it is that's turning uh, in a turn, in a circular turn. And we're going to assume that there is no friction for this problem. If you imagine if the car was sitting still, it would want to slide down the slope, so the friction would be up the slope. And if it was going very, very fast, it would try to fly out of the circle and try to move up the ramp. So the friction then is down the ramp in that case. So there must be some in-between speed where there is no friction needed. And that's the uh, example we're going to be considering right now. So in our force diagram, there is only the normal force, which is perpendicular to the roadway surface, and it is at the same angle as the roadway surface. And the weight is straight down, of course. So you'll notice that this force diagram looks very similar to the plane on a string problem, uh, except instead of tension now, it's the normal force. So you can follow through the algebra. It, it, it's very similar to the toy plane, except instead of tension now and X and Y components of tension, we have X and Y components of the normal force. So we see that the Y component of the normal force is what holds up the weight, and the X component of the normal force is what provides the centripetal force that causes the car or bike to uh, turn and move in a circle. And we see that we get the same equations for the velocity and for the period. So here I've got a funnel, and I've got a ball bearing. And I'll put the ball bearing in the funnel. And if there's no velocity, of course, it falls straight down to the middle. So if I give it some circular motion, now an object in motion wants to travel on a straight line, but the wall of the funnel is in the way, and a component of the normal force provides the centripetal force that keeps it moving in a circle. And if I adjust the speed of the ball, I change the size of the circle. Faster, slower. Cool. The last example we'll look at is that of a satellite orbiting the Earth. A satellite moves around Earth in circular motion, and here's a diagram of that happening. If a satellite was orbiting the Earth at the equator, this would be looking at it from above the North Pole. So you see there is tangential velocity, and the satellite moves in a circle. 
A is the altitude above Earth's surface. This solid line circle is the Earth itself. So from the center of the Earth to here is the radius of the Earth. And then from the surface of the Earth to the satellite is the altitude of the satellite above Earth's surface. So the radius of the circle that the satellite is traveling in is the sum of Earth's radius and its altitude. And that's what we see uh, over here. Looking at it now from the plane of the equator, uh, here would be the radius of the Earth. Here would be the distance from the Earth to the satellite. And here is the satellite as it moves in a circle into and out of the page. As always, we'll let the positive x direction be towards the center of the circle. And the force that acts as the centripetal force is the force of gravity. The force of gravity, as we know, acts towards the center of the Earth. So that fits our definition of centripetal force, a force directed towards the center of the circle. And using Newton's law of universal gravitation that says the force of gravity between two objects is equal to the universal gravitational constant times the mass of the first object times the mass of the second object divided by the radius of the circle squared, where now the object is little m for mass of the satellite and big M sub e for mass of the Earth. We'll start off with our equation for tangential velocity that is circumference divided by period. And we also use our equation for Newton's second law for centripetal motion. The sum of the forces in the x is equal to mass times centripetal acceleration. And the centripetal force is the gravitational force, which we said comes from Newton's universal law of gravitation. And mass times v squared over r for centripetal acceleration. We see that the mass of the satellite is on both sides of the equation, so it drops out it turns out uh, that the mass of the orbiting body is not important. And then we solve what's left for velocity, the tangential velocity of the satellite. Note that it is dependent upon the radius of its uh, circle. In other words, the velocity of a satellite is dependent upon its altitude, but not its mass. Then we take our equation for velocity and we substitute it in over here in our equation for velocity and that is related to the circumference and the period. So making that substitution, squaring both sides, rearranging and solving for t, we get our equation that tells us the period of the satellite. It depends upon the radius of the circle, the universal gravitational constant, and the mass of the planet about which it is orbiting. You might notice this equation here that says the square of the period is proportional to the cube of the radius. That is Kepler's third law. Also, let's take this opportunity to introduce a term that you will see, and that is geosynchronous orbit. That is a very specific radius of orbit that produces a period that is exactly one day long. Why is that beneficial? A geosynchronous orbit means that a satellite will remain above the same spot on Earth as it rotates about the planet and it matches the planet's rotation. So it's always above the same spot of the Earth. So it's always in the same spot of the sky. And in order for that to be true, it needs to be in the equatorial plane. 